Hi, I'm Macy from the Charleston County Public Library, and thanks for watching this virtual program. September is Library Card Sign-Up Month, and your Charleston County Library Card is the key to a wealth of information and resources for free. Of course we have tons of books. We also have movies, telescopes, museum passes, and gaming tablets for kids. And your library card gives you access to tons of digital content, like ebooks, audiobooks, music, and magazine subscriptions, plus access to databases for professional development, learning a new language, and genealogy research. Your library card is available for free if you live in Charleston County. Just stop by your neighborhood branch with your proof of address and your ID. For more information, visit ccpl.org. Hello and welcome to another episode of Useless Information. My name is Daryl Woods down here in the lower left hand corner and I work at Adult Services at Hollywood St. Paul's. And today we're going to be looking at the category of commerce and our topic is companies that change directions. So these are companies that uh, used to produce something or offer some service uh, but now they're famously known for offering something else. Uh, the first example is one that uh, many people are aware of. Nintendo is actually a fairly old company. They started in 1889 as a playing card company. And then before they ended up in uh, toys, which of course led to video games, they had some various interests. They diversified into uh, offering a taxi service. They had some factories that produced interest rice. Uh, they offered hourly hotels, which is probably what you think it is. And then they got into toys. Uh, the most famous toy that Nintendo produced was called the Ultra Hand. And this was this plastic extendable arm. So you would grip it and then it would reach out and it would grab onto something with these little suction cup fingers um, and then it could retract. And so that was a lot of fun. So they got into the gaming business in the 70s when they purchased the rights to produce the Magnavox Odyssey gaming console just for Japan. We uh, Today we have a tendency to think of video games as being kind of a Japanese product, but um, Magnavox was a trailblazer, and um, uh, a lot of Japanese companies kind of copied what Magnavox and some of these others were actually producing. So then they saw that the arcade industry was booming, and so they created some uh, pretty famous arcade machines. Most prominently was Donkey Kong, which featured this little plumber uh, who was trying to rescue the princess. And of course, this plumber was known as Mario. So when they did create their first uh, entertainment system, gaming console in 1985, they were able to feature exclusive contact, content like Super Mario Brothers. American Express and Wells Fargo, uh, two very big names in the finance industry, they, both of them originally started out as one company. They were both part of American Express and they were uh, a delivery system, kind of like the Pony Express. They would offer um, the ability to ship money and goods back and forth from the settled areas of the Northwest to those frontier regions of the Midwest and eventually the Wild West. Um, but before they got to the Wild West, two of the founders, Wells and Fargo, uh, pulled out and decided they were going to create a rival shipping company. And that, of course, famously became a bank. So let's, we're going to focus a little bit more on what happened with American Express, though, because I think their story is a little bit more interesting. So American Express later shifted into not becoming a bank, but serving banks. Once again, transferring uh, money between interests. Uh, obviously, they work very closely with banks once those banks have been established in the West. And one of the ways they did this is through money orders. 
And then they offered the world's first traveler's checks in 1891, which became very popular in the 60s and 70s before there was such thing as uh, credit cards, debit cards, things like that. It was a kind of a way to uh, make sure that your money remained your money until you signed it over to somebody. And then we did have the credit card. They didn't have the uh, very first credit card. Uh, that was the Diners Club. But after, before they got to the credit card, uh, they became a major player in the travel industry. So in fact, in the 40s and 50s, if you were traveling uh, extensively, perhaps overseas, you probably dealt in some way with American Express in order to coordinate that travel. But then they brought it back together and uh, decided they were going to focus on their charge card. Berkshire Hathaway is a famous and powerful holding company. Uh, they own controlling interests in Geico and Duracell Batteries and Dairy Queen and Fruit of the Loom and Pampered Chef, among many, many other well-known brands. And they also offer, uh, they also have uh, partial interest in an innumerable number of companies. Uh, yeah, we won't get into all of those because it's, it's a lot. But, so this company started as a textile company named the Valley Falls Company out of Rhode Island in 1839. They ended up merging with Berkshire Cotton and later Hathaway Manufacturing and that resulted in the name change to Berkshire Hathaway. So Warren Buffett, who had nothing to actually do with Berkshire Hathaway, he noticed a trend. Berkshire Hathaway, like all businesses, had some good times and some bad times. When they were having good times, they were opening up new textile mills. When they were having bad times, they would close textile mills. And he saw a trend that their uh, stock prices would fluctuate based on whether they were opening or closing mills. So he took advantage of that and bought up a lot of stock when it was low and tried to sell it when it was high. But at one point he realized he had way too much stock in an industry, the textile industry, that he thought was headed in a downward direction. So he was trying to offload the stock and so he went to the owners of Berkshire Hathaway and he said, I would love to sell the stock back to you. And so they came to an oral agreement of how much they were going to uh, buy back the stock for. But the next day, when this agreement was typed up, uh, they actually offered him one eighth of a cent less per share than what they had agreed to the previous day. Well, Warren Buffett obviously didn't like that. So instead, what he did was he uh, reneged on this agreement, he backed out of this agreement, and he went to other shareholders and ended up buying majority control of this company. But of course, this was a company he didn't want in the first place. So, like I said, he thought textiles were on a downward trend. He didn't want to be in the textile business, but here he is now, a the prime shareholder of of, of a major textile company. So what he did was he fired the previous owners and uh, got out of the textile business and decided that Berkshire Hathaway would be an insurance business. He bought out National Indemnity Company and just a couple of years later bought a controlling stake in Geico. And then, like I said, he got involved in a lot of other uh, businesses as well, uh, turning this into a holding company. Um, what's interesting though, even though this is how Warren Buffett kind of made his mark as a financier, uh, he calls this his biggest mistake because he figures that if he had invested directly in insurance companies instead of redirecting a textile business, he may have earned as much as $200 billion more. And I mean, as much as Warren Buffett knows about money, he's probably right. Uh, Shell Oil, or as it's known internationally, the Royal Dutch Shell Company, started as a small antique store in London's East End in the 1830s. Uh, so it's kind of crazy to imagine that this major oil company that's primarily thought of as an American petroleum company, uh, actually started as an antique store in Britain. And 
uh, in this antique store um, named after shells, you can imagine that they sold a lot of uh, decorative shells. And so as they were trying to acquire more decorative shells, they ended up expanding into the import-export business. And this interest in the import-export business caused them to get into shipping. And the shipping business oversaw the development of the world's first bulk oil tanker to navigate the Suez Canal in 1892. And so now they're in the, the shipping business and they're primarily shipping oil and they are working with this uh, uh, other oil company that they are um, you know providing the shipping for and so this other company the Royal Dutch Petroleum Company they decided uh, that they should merge with Shell uh, so that they could compete directly with Standard Oil in the early 20th century and now there are over 44,000 Shell stations worldwide so it seems like it was a good decision. Crazy though, the, the, the little <laughs> antique shop in Britain became this international oil company. Uh, Nokia it was a Finnish company. Uh, for some reason, the name kind of makes us think that it might be a Japanese company, especially seeing they were in the cell phone business. Um, we kind of think of technologies like that as generally uh, Japanese, but they started as a Finnish company and started as a paper company. Their first paper mill was in 1871, so way before cell phones were even anybody's imagination. And they merged with two other Finnish companies, one that made rubber products and one that produced installed cables. And so this new Nokia company uh, their biggest seller were these rubber boots that were sleek. You can see, kind of, kind of look like fancy cowboy boots here. And because they're made out of rubber, uh, they're also very colorful, or can be very colorful. So then they added an electronics division that began making radio phones for the military. And by the 1990s, uh, that business was doing so well that they sold off their rubber and paper interests uh, in order to focus just on cell phones. And the rest, as you can, would say, is history because for 14 consecutive years, Nokia was number one in cell phone sales. So Xerox was founded in 1906 in Rochester, New York. Uh, but Xerox was nowhere in their name. They started as the Halloid Photographic Company. They produced uh, photography equipment and paper. Uh, had nothing to do with copiers or printers whatsoever. But in 1946, uh, their owner produced, uh, purchased an invention that created electronic images using a dry powder, and he called that process zeography after the Latin words for dry and writing. And then they produced their first automatic copier in 1955 and changed their name to Xerox in 1961. Tiffany's started off as a stationery store in 1837. Now, of course, uh, making the leap into jewelry uh, doesn't seem like that big of a jump. Um, because, of course, uh, stationary stores are, are kind of uh, serve the same clientele for the most part. Um, you know, they are clean, uh, fancy places very frequently. Um, but it is kind of interesting that they uh, started doing so well selling jewelry that they started producing their own. And, of course, now they even have um, uh, schools where they teach people uh, and companies how to produce fine jewelry. LG started in South Korea as the Lakhui uh, Chemical Company in 1947. So produced chemicals. And because they were working on chemicals, it wasn't too far of a stretch for them to then begin focusing on plastics four years later. 
and that success allowed them to expand into electronics in 1958. They created a new company that was under the Lakhui uh, brand called Gold Star. So there was this one company, the major company, the mother company, if you will, um, that rebranded itself at, from Lakhui to Lucky because they sounded similar. And that company focused on hygiene products. Once again, not too big of a leap from chemicals um, into hygiene products. And then Gold Star continued to make electronics, but in, in the West, there's no division between them. In the West, we have Lucky and Gold Star who produce um, electronics and appliances to the rest of the world. And LG stands for Lucky Gold Star. The Gap started as a record store. And one of the things that they offered was they also sold jeans. And initially, the jeans didn't sell much. And then they hit upon the idea of what if we could guarantee that every size and style of Levi's would be in stock on any given day. And um, once they were able to advertise that they could do that, then suddenly that became the big seller and then eventually records uh, went out the window. 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing is what that 3M stands for. They uh, initially sold a mineral called corundum, which is a long way from making post-it notes, it seems to me. Wrigley was a soap company and baking soda company. The gum was just this little throwaway product. It was just this incentive that they um, gave away. If you buy so much soap, we'll give you a stick of gum. And then eventually the gum became more popular than the soap. DuPont Chemical Company uh, started off as producing gunpowder and then later dynamite. And then they were exclusively a producer of gunpowder and dynamite for well over a hundred years. Um, we don't think of them that way anymore, do we? Hasbro was another textile company, uh, mostly focusing on textile remnants. And then from there, they got into school supplies. Okay, once again, kind of a logical uh, direction. And then from school supplies into toys, which of course, uh, they're one of the major producers in the world of toys today. Colgate used to deal with all sorts of hygiene products, um, and they're a fairly old company from 1806, uh, but they weren't producing any toothpaste until 1873, and now, of course, that's the thing that we um, think about Colgate as, as a toothpaste. Abercrombie and Finch. Uh, Fitch was a sporting goods store and they provided outfitting goods. Uh, they didn't start outfitting college kids until they were bought out by Limited in 1988 and of course then their brand and product line changed somewhat dramatically. Obviously still in uh, as far as uh, you know what you wear but they're not making rifles, basketballs, you know that kind of thing any longer. All right, so I went to these sources in order to find out the what I thought were some of the more interesting uh, companies that are no longer doing the things that they started with and became something completely different. And I'd like to send a special thanks to Maya for creating these wonderfully attractive slides. And uh, nice to have her back last week, though the uglier slides, as you saw, were, were my inventions. Um, so yes, yeah, nice to have her back. And if you found this interesting, then I think you're also going to find our virtual trivia night interesting. It happens every Thursday at 8 p.m. on Facebook. So to join us, you can go to this URL that you see here, or you can just go to Facebook and type in virtual trivia night, and you are bound to find us every Thursday at 8 p.m. So once again, this has been Useless Information. Uh, my name is Daryl Woods. I would love it if you would leave some sort of comment. You can do so down below or uh, you can email me at the email address that you see here. Uh, always open to 
hear your questions. If something that I said intrigued you, then you're like, I'd like to find out more information about that. Or you have some comments, maybe some corrections. Maybe I messed something up. Uh, please let me know. If you have suggestions on maybe something you'd like to see here, um, I'd like to hear that as well. Uh, next week, we're still going to be in the topic of the category of commerce. And I have something else that I think you're going to find to be of interest, or I hope so anyway. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.